Hello, and welcome from my backyard again. Um, you'll notice uh, that I've pretty much been here the last few times, unless I happen to be out, because um, I have a, uh, you can see the canopy right here, and it's just now starting to rain a little bit, so I'm, you know, safe from the rain here. Not from the bugs, but from the rain. I tried to um, bring this to you from lovely Delian Springs, because I thought, Oh, uh, um, you know, we're still sort of in lockdown, so I'll go to Delian Springs. And um, Delian Springs, it, it, everybody else knows that Delian Springs is open and ready to go because there were 10 cars waiting to get in to the spring. Uh, it was that full. And it, I looked then, then, of course, by then, I looked on the website, and it didn't say anything about getting full that early, but they did say that the old mill... Pancake House restaurant is open, which means, of course, the Land Springs is full because the Old Mill Pancake Restaurant is the coolest place to have breakfast um, that I know of because you get to make your own pancakes and they grind their own grain to make the batter for the pancakes that you can make your own of right there in the griddle in the middle of your table in the historic sugar mill building um, there at Delian Springs. Um, and so if you've never been, uh, just as well you didn't try to go today because it was full, but if you go early in the morning sometime or you don't mind waiting, uh, or you can go, I guess, on a, a weekday, but check the website, that it's, uh, it really is wonderful. But all that to say, I'm not at Delian Springs telling you this, I'm at my house because I went all the way and found I couldn't get in, which, you know, it's an hour drive, so there you go. Other than that, thank you all for um, coming along the ride once again, and um, here we are, uh, way in the, at the end of August, and I'm reading to you from Exodus chapter 3, and here it is. Now. Uh, I want you to remember um, what I've been telling you that for the past little while about the difference between all caps L-O-R-D and lower caps L-O-R-D. Um, and I'm reading to you from the Jerusalem Bible, which means that it's um, a bit different translation than, um, than you're used to maybe. And so if you're reading along in the, uh, pretty much any other translation, you'll notice the difference at a couple points. And here it is. So, uh, uh, you know, put me on pause, go grab your King James or your NIV or your New American Standard Bible, any of those, and, um, you know, come on back and here we go. Exodus chapter 3. Moses was looking after the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, a priest of Midian. He led his flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, or Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in the shape of a flame of fire coming from the middle of the bush. Moses looked. There the bush was blazing but was not being burned up. I must go now and look at this strange sight, Moses said, and see why the bush is not burned up. Now, Yahweh saw him go. You, you hear that, right? That they're calling him Yahweh here in this Bible as opposed to the Lord. Because remember, all caps, L-O-R-D, uh, is um, the, the Bible code for the fact that they're using Yahweh. But generally in Hebrew, don't pronounce it. Whereas these Jerusalem Bible guys, they're all over it. Now Yahweh saw him go forward and look, and God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. He answered, come no nearer, take off your shoes for the place on which you stand as holy ground. I am the God of your father, he said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses covered his face, afraid to look at God. And Yahweh said, I have seen the miserable state of my people in Egypt. I have heard their appeal to be free from their slave drivers. Yes, I am well aware of their sufferings. 
I mean to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of the land to a rich land and brought a land where milk and honey flow, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Now the cry of the son of Israel has come to me, and I have witnessed the way the Egyptians have oppressed them. So come, I send you to Pharaoh to bring the sons of Israel, my people, out of Egypt. Moses said, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? I shall be with you, was the answer. And this is the sign by which you shall know that it is I have sent you. After you have led the people out of Egypt, you are to offer worship to God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, I am to go then to the sons of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent you has sent me to you. But if they ask me what his name is, what am I to tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This, he added, is what you must say to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, Who you are to say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name for all time. By this name I shall be invoked. For all generations to come because uh, you know here they're saying it's that's that's the name YHWH um, which were the initials for uh, I am that I am um, or a way of spelling he is um, and this is where you know this is where we get it the I am that I am and of the the big difference is of course that here they just spell out Yahweh they're just saying um, the, what would have been an unpronounceable name for the Jews but the Jerusalem Bible people didn't um, feel any compunction in not using Yahweh to do that and I just wanted to point that out to you as you're reading uh, that that is um, the the reading that you would get uh, if you were translating L-O-R-D in all caps down to Yahweh and you'd see that right here and that's how they do that but that's not the point that I wanted to make uh, but it you know was sort of on the way and we've talked about that various times it struck me that I as I was reading this that it started Moses was looking after the flock of Jethro's father-in-law priest of Midian not you know priest of the Israelite um, so he's in Midian. He, uh, you know, married a, a non-Israelite because he, you know, got chased away for the whole murder thing. And it struck me that as I was reading that, that um, God knew exactly who he was calling as, as he was, you know, saying, Moses, come on over to the spring bush and, and I got a job for you to do because uh, it was a complicated thing who who was being called right then because remember Moses was the uh, and, you know and we've gone over a bit of his story but Moses was um, uh, illegal at birth he was you know his 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 being kept alive was a crime at the time so he was uh, a you know a criminal from the very beginning he wasn't welcomed into the world by the Egyptians and then his uh, his existence was a lie after that because they you know if at any point they'd have said to the Pharaoh oh, he's a, an, a he's an Israelite boy uh, he would have known that he should have died but they never said that and then he's you know raised as a prince kills somebody so now he's a you know uh, illegally born or illegally kept alive um, had to have his birth hidden and then illegally kept alive lived a lie his entire life until he became a murderer and went and became a, a, you know a shepherd for non-israelites and married someone out of the faith so he just had all these things going for him <laughs> as far as being the leader of his people and you could just imagine all of that going through his head when uh, you know God said well you're the one that's going to carry my message and he's saying who am I he knew exactly what he meant when he said who am I he didn't just mean I have a speech impediment although he did that certainly added to the um, uh, the whole list of things as to who am I 
But the who am I was that whole uh, litany of realities of Moses' life that when he went to the people of Israel, he would have to um, reckon with. He would have to say, you know, because somebody uh, there still remembered him being the murderer. Somebody there still remembered him being a prince of Egypt, the people who were oppressing them. You know, people remembered all these things. And uh, not all of it would, would put him in a favorable light. So God chooses this dude, who you've got to think is not the most likely guy to be leading his people, um, to be carrying his message, to be the, the bearer of his message, and yet God specifically picks him. There wasn't anybody else in that wilderness on that side of the mountain that day. God just didn't keep that bush burning 24-7 in case somebody happened by. You know, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, Jim. Uh, well, hey, Jim, how you doing? What, you want to go take my message? Uh, no, thanks. Well, okay, head on, you know. Oh, hi, I'm Phyllis. Uh, Phyllis, what about it? Dennis, no, no, I don't want to take your message either. Moses, oh, okay. It wasn't like that. He chose... Moses to be the one knowing his entire sordid past and that he was in many ways the uh, the least qualified to do the work if you were looking at his resume any resume committee would have said well Moses I thank you for applying to be the leader of Israel but I've got to say with your whole um, uh, you know, consorting with the enemy, marrying somebody out of the faith, and then, you know, killing somebody. Uh, kind of black marks on your record here, Mo. Can we call you Mo? That that, that wasn't, uh, you know, maybe who they were looking for, and yet there it was. God chose him. And I thought about that because when you're, uh, you know, reading at the end of Matthew, and there's the, the Great Commission, and he says, go there for and make disciples of all nations. Can you imagine who he's talking to right then? He's talking to, you know, perfect people who have all their ducks in a row. He's talking to, the, you know, the people who have no longer sin and have uh, the whole theology of Christianity worked out so that they have an answer for everything. Uh, that's who he's talking to. He's certainly not talking to me. He's not talking to you. He's talking to the perfect people um, that can do what needs to be done because how laughable to think that he would choose somebody that was um, imperfect until you read Exodus here when he chose Moses who was not perfect and far from being perfect had a really spotty record and they realized that God is calling me with all my failures and inabilities with all my uh, you know objectionable features that God is choosing me to be the bearer of his message and of course he's choosing you whatever is holding you back whatever the problem is God is choosing you he's calling your name not from the burning bush because we have God's word written and in that it's pretty clear that you and I are called to be the bearers of his word to those around us uh, in different ways and of course um, you know if somebody says well who are you to be telling me about my sin well <laughs> as a matter of fact um I am, uh, you know, one whose sins were forgiven by God. And in that sense, I, I, I'm perfectly able to talk to anybody else about their sins because uh, my sins were forgiven by a righteous, all-loving God. And he didn't hold them against me. That's who I am. And, and Christ's blood covered all that for me.
which is incredible. You'd think God would have had, you know, uh, more self-respect than to, you know, pick someone like me and say, you know, well, thanks, Eric, but I really have some better prospects going on. The fact is, there are perfect people. Well, no, there aren't. But there are people better suited to doing the job. And maybe they're doing it. But God called all of us to be perfectly redeemed by him and to, you know, scrape up the shards of our otherwise imperfect life and to be his witnesses right now. And, um, it, you know, when God calls Moses and he's aware of all of his failures, it's easy to read that as being, you know, uh, well, but who am I to what's your name? So it's like, oh, well, God won't tell me his name, so I'm off the hook. I don't think that was it necessarily. But I think that he did want to make sure that uh, who he was um, following and talking to, and he recognized that the, you know, the God of the ages was indeed calling him and empowering him to do the work, to be the one to set his people free and of course metaphorically that's exactly what we're to do is to help all of those around us to be free in that same way to to find the path to god's freedom to to be moses hard in the modern age to see you know the parallels are are sometimes murky <laughs> But the reality is, uh, God is intentional in asking each one of us to be his witness. Not to wait till we're perfect, not to wait till we're perfectly articulate, um, and not to expect that everyone's going to, you know, clap for us. The fact is, Moses had a bit of a rocky time, as we'll find out as we continue to read his story. But none of that means that God's power doesn't rest on us. None of it means that we won't make mistakes at times. I certainly have. But it does mean that God wishes each one of us to be his spokesperson and to find ways to do that wherever and whenever we are and whatever the circumstances around us. And that that's important that we continue to live that reality and that we can live that reality which is pretty cool. And there it is. So, Exodus 3, and uh, thank you all for listening. I appreciate your continually, uh, your, uh, you know, tuning in and continuing to be part of the church. Um, at some point we'll be back together. I've said that how many times now? I've lost track. But um, I do know that at some point <laughs> this will all went out and there will be, and I'll be able to, uh, you know, fist bump you or elbow bump you or maybe even hug you whenever that happens. Until then, thank you all. I love you, and stay safe.